Now for a deeper assessment of the war in Ukraine, senior fellow, the Potomac Foundation, Dennis Kurak, joins me virtually from New York City in the United States. Thank you so much for joining us. Half of the Ukraine's energy infrastructure is either damaged or destroyed, and <coughs> it's already having knock-on effect on the health system, on people's health. What's your reading of the conditions the Ukrainians are finding themselves? Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, of course, the situation uh, is not easy, and uh, Russians have started to um, deploy this intimidation tactics because they have failed on the battleground, which all the world sees by now. So they're trying to pursue Ukraine to so-called negotiations, as they call it, which is rather in a uh, form of ultimatum. Uh, as they see it, because uh, the negotiations, the, the conditions that they're proposing are based on uh, solely their understanding of the situation, which I believe is uh, quite, uh, it doesn't correspond to reality. Um, so Ukraine was never and is never, has never said it's not going to negotiate. Um, and uh, well, for that matter, we are, and I'm a Ukrainian myself, so Ukrainian government is doing everything possible uh, to secure uh, the energy supply to people. And um, I'm following the news very closely from the ground. And uh, Ukrainians are, do are still doing amazing work as they've done in the first month of war. They're still doing the same. And I'm sure Ukraine will be able to get through the winter um, um, and then to become even more stronger in the end. You know, I'm sure this is actually, you know, harrowing experience that um, you are actually going through, especially with the people back home. But then the WHO documented more than 700 attacks on health infrastructure since Russia's invasion began in mm -hmm. late February. So the Ukrainians are likely to face unique health challenges, including that of respiratory infections. How would you describe the emergency response <coughs> for the Ukrainians? Uh, well, uh, I myself involved in a couple of uh, humanitarian uh, response projects, including medical ones. Um, so Ukraine has traditionally been a, uh, very developed in, in medical infrastructure. Yeah, of course, a lot of it uh, was destroyed, but it's not like half of it is destroyed. So uh, there are still a lot of function hospitals. There are a lot of people, doctors from over the world coming in to help. Um, this is happening on the everyday basis, so um, I'm sure Ukraine will be able to cope with the challenges as well. Um, however, additional help is always needed, and uh, we would really appreciate, uh, you know, uh, that Nigerian government and uh, African governments in, in general would uh, have a more, um, <clears throat> you know, stronger stance uh, on what's happening. Well, um, we know that about 17,000 HIV, for instance, HIV patients in Donetsk who may soon run out of critical antiretroviral drugs that help you know, keep them alive. With the fact that much of Donetsk is under Russian control, how imperative would creating a humanitarian health corridor into all the newly regained and occupied areas, uh, how, how imperative will it be? Well, the only organization that has access to the occupied territories is the International Committee of Red Cross, which has proven itself not very effective uh, during the war, and it has received major criticism uh, from uh, both Ukrainian government and some of the Western governments um, for actually translating uh, the aggressor Russian narratives and uh, you know not doing enough. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for this. I just hope that those people will be helped uh, promptly uh, by whoever they could be helped. Well, um, if, if I let you go, you know, the, being a Ukrainian and watching all the things that are happening, you know, the kind of hammering your country is getting from Russia and the fact that your country actually stands tall against the external aggression is you know, someone who is very close to you. So what sense of, does this give you a sense of pride about the patriotism your your uh, countrymen have actually showed in uh, in in reacting to external aggression. 
Well, of course, uh, and uh, Ukrainians, were always a very proud nation, but proud to the extent that we don't want to harm anyone else. So um, all our history, we haven't been an aggressor. And uh, actually, Ukrainian patriotism uh, is, is very defensive and has always been defensive because um, for a few hundred years, we had to fight Russian aggression for that matter. Um, so, yeah, of course, it gives me pride and I'm sure we will win. Um, it's just, uh, you know, the amount of human suffering is unbearable. Um, for Ukrainians, um, just as my example, we have, I still remember February 24th morning as it was yesterday or even today. So it's like one never ending day. But that also means that we'll stand to the end and uh, we'll win this. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, I'm sure you must have seen the report that actually talks about, you know, uh, you know, Russia going into, you know, talks with um, Iran for the delivery of drones for the mm -hmm. war with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. How are you reading this? Or how re will you react to this particular, you know, development? Well, Russia tries to find allies that they can find. I think everyone saw uh, last UN resolution voting about seizure of Russian assets um, and uh, the previous one um, and yesterday's voting uh, of the NATO General Assembly of uh, uh, recognizing Russia as a country terrorist. Um, so, yeah, well, the country's terrorists are uniting in, in trying to... Uh, uh, in trying to achieve some kind of the result. Uh, it's really unclear what kind of the result will they achieve uh, because, well, yeah, of course, they can damage more infrastructure, Yeah, they, but this will not change the strategic situation uh, on the battleground. And uh, this all looks like, you know, desperate moves, uh, like convulsions uh, before the end. Mm. Well, we know that a lot of countries have actually, you know, come to your country's aid, you know, helping in terms of delivery of, um, you know, fighting, you know, ammunition and all that. Do you think you're getting enough from the NATO countries, you know, the West precisely? How much do you think they've done for your country to stand tall against this, you know, belligerent nation against your country? Um. Yeah, we are very appreciative of all the help that we're getting. And of course, without this help, would uh, be impossible to turn the tide of war as we've done. But uh, uh, the West understands that uh, we're fighting for NATO, actually. We de facto became a NATO eastern flank and uh, combined Ukrainian armed forces are now, you know, probably the uh, Ukrainian armed forces are bigger than the uh, last 10 NATO countries that joined uh, NATO together. And, uh, you know, because of the battle experience, um, I'm sure we'll be a NATO ally for for much more time to come. And this has de facto happened, although we are not uh, officially a NATO member state. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Russia has really uh, huge amounts and stockpiles of very old uh, equipment, which they're now given to the mobilized people to use. So, um, of course, uh, more weapons are needed, especially air defense systems and especially longer range missiles. Um, and the, the more they, they are supplied, the faster the sense for the whole world. And, uh, you know, the world can start uh, thinking of, of uh, yeah. proper things such as, right, you know, Dennis, development and <laughs> not war. Yeah. Right, Dennis, a very quick one. Uh, a lot of um, other, uh, you know, pundits have said and some other countries, especially the United Nations and so on, uh, in the International Criminal of Justice, saying that uh, Putin might be put through prosecution and might be also indicted for war crimes. Would you also agree to that? Would you subscribe to that? Uh, as Ukrainian, of course. And, uh, yeah, we have seen some movements, uh, and you know, definitely the political will is there, uh, although still, for some reason, people are trying to avoid naming him personally um, uh, as one of the uh, commanders of, of all this mess. However, uh, so uh, on the one hand, politically, people are saying this. On the other hand, uh, um, international institutions uh, or courts, um, such as the recent um, decision of the Hague Court last week about the uh, MH17 catastrophe, 
Uh, no one named uh, Putin as the uh, as the responsible person. However, he clearly gave commands because no one else could have done, given commands to Russian military to shoot planes uh, because the Ministry of Defense is under his command. Mm. Anyway, uh, international law is a very complicated mechanism and unfortunately it's not very effective. So um, most likely he will have political or physical consequences himself, uh, such as death rather than... Uh, being, uh, you know, imprisoned and brought to justice in a proper way. Absolutely. A Ukrainian and a senior fellow, the Potomac Foundation, Dennis Kurak, who is joining me from uh, Thank you so New much. York, United States. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. Thanks.